The Trinity in the Old Testament. Introduction. The Trinity is not only present in the verses of the Old Testament, but portrayed clearly enough to see with the benefit of New Testament revelation. When God says, Let us make man in our image, Genesis 1.26, when the angels of God praise him with their threefold, Holy, 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 Isaiah 6.3, when Aaron's sons are told to put my name on the Israelites with a triple blessing, Numbers 6.24-26, the clear intent is to reflect, if not to convey, the triune nature of God. Moreover, some Old Testament scriptures cast the Trinity in even sharper relief, such as King David's last words, which in quick succession refer to God as the Spirit of the Lord, the God of Israel, and the Rock of Israel, 2 Samuel 23, 2 and 3. See 1 Corinthians 10, 4 for the image of Christ as Israel's rock. There are many other passages commonly cited to demonstrate the reality of the Trinity in the Old Testament, a reality shimmering just beneath the veil, for example, Isaiah 48, 15-17. But perhaps the best example is the one used by our Lord to demonstrate that His divinity was indeed prophesied by Scripture. As the Pharisees were gathering together, Jesus put a question to them, saying, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is He? They answered Him, David's son. Then He said to them, Well then, how can David, speaking in the Spirit, call Him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit down at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Psalm 110.1 So if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare to question him any longer from that day forward. Matthew 22.41-46 We are not to assume that David, when he penned this prophecy under divine inspiration, saw the coming Christ as clearly as he wished to. Indeed, we have it from Christ that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what was being revealed to Jesus' generation face to face, namely, the unveiling of the Messiah, Matthew 13, 17. The revelation of Jesus Christ to the world during His first advent, in addition to explaining passages such as Psalm 110, 1, Christ is David's Son in His humanity, but David's Lord in His deity, is also, not coincidentally, the basis for explaining many other Old Testament passages that are only fully understood by means of our likewise now more complete understanding of the Trinity. In the Old Testament, the three persons stand in front of us like three mighty mountains, one after the other, all partially visible, but not readily distinguishable from each other. Only with the revelation provided by the incarnation of Jesus Christ and the New Testament do we see the Old Testament picture of the Trinity from a sidelong perspective, so that now the three mountains become visible in their own right when viewed from this new vantage point. But the question still remains exactly why did God decide to veil the triune nature of His essence in Old Testament times, choosing instead to foreshadow it in the manner discussed. Phidolatry, a major problem in ancient times and one of Israel's most serious stumbling blocks, is often adduced as the reason for this veiling in pre-Christian times of our present knowledge of the Trinity. Certainly it is true that the threat of idolatry to the faith and practice of Old Testament believers was a very real one. We need only to consider that the first two of the Ten Commandments deal with this subject, Exodus 21 through 6, and that Balaam's counsel of idolatrous seduction was more destructive to Israel than any curse could ever have been, Numbers 25. The argument suggests that there was, therefore, a need to emphasize the oneness of God in the face of this very real polytheistic threat, thus obviating any possible twisting of a proper understanding of the Trinity. This explanation possesses much of value, but it does not entirely resolve the matter, however. The full answer lies in the person of Jesus Christ. Before the fact, before we see with our own eyes Christ come in the flesh, His humility, His suffering, His sacrifice for us, can we really appreciate in full the Trinity and what God has chosen to do for us in Christ's incarnation and death on the cross? Without the accomplished reality of the incarnation of Jesus, how could we ever but dimly conceive the glory of it? And without the accomplished fact of His incarnation, how could we possibly understand and appreciate the triune nature of God? For it is only through Christ, after He has come into the world in person, that we begin to see God with the clarity of vision it has now been given us to possess,
John 1, 18 and 14, 9. Just as the temple veil that symbolically separated us from the presence of God was split in two by Christ's sacrifice on our behalf, Matthew 27, 51, so the veil that in the Old Testament partially obscured the person of Christ from our view has been lifted by his actual advent in the flesh to die on our behalf, so that now through our faith in Jesus Christ we see God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit more clearly than we ever could before. For God who said, Let light shine forth from the darkness, is he who has shone forth his light into our hearts to illuminate our knowledge of God's glory in the person of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 For until this very day, the same veil remains upon their unbelieving hearts when the Old Testament is read, and it is not removed when they hear these scriptures, because it is only done away with in Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 we see the Son more clearly after He comes into the world, John 1, 14. The Son can only reveal the Father more clearly after He comes into the world, John 1, 18. The Spirit cannot be sent to indwell believers until after the Son has been glorified, John 7, 39. Therefore, the Trinity can only be clearly explained and understood after the first advent of Christ, a task undertaken by the New Testament, while in the Old Testament, before the first advent, the members of the Trinity are, understandably, not as clearly distinguished as they are in the New Testament. The Messiah prefigured in the Old Testament. Contrary to much conventional wisdom about the Old Testament, Jesus Christ and His sacrifice on our behalf is depicted everywhere in the Old Testament. Furthermore, we know from New Testament Scripture that the necessity for the mission and suffering of the Messiah was understood clearly enough by Old Testament believers as Christ explains on the road to Emmaus Luke 24, 27. In fact, there are in the Old Testament a large variety of types employed to prefigure the incarnation, death and suffering of the Son of God on our behalf. The subject of typology will be covered in more extensive detail in Part 4a of this series, Christology, but two major categories of the Old Testament's portrayal of the suffering of Christ should be mentioned now. Blood Sacrifice from the coats of skin that God provides for Adam and Eve to indicate that one will die in their place, Genesis 3.21, to Abel's sacrifice, superior to Cain's because it depicts the substitute's death, Genesis 4.4, 4, to the Noahic covenant demanding respect for blood that represents the death of another in our place, Genesis 9.4, to the whole elaborate series of sacrifices commanded by the Mosaic law, all of which portray redemption through another's blood, God made extensive use of the teaching aid of blood sacrifice in order that it might be crystal clear to all Old Testament believers that forgiveness of their sins was no light matter. It was something that only God could do for them, and it involved a steep and bloody price that God would somehow have to pay Himself on behalf of those who trusted in Him. Prophecy The substitutionary suffering and death of Christ on our behalf is predicted and prophesied throughout the Old Testament, for example. Genesis 3.15, He will crush your head and you, serpent, will strike his heel. Numbers 21.9, So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a staff, and it came to pass that whoever was bitten by a serpent then looked at the bronze serpent would live. Psalm 22.1, My God, my God, why did you forsake me? Isaiah 53.3, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with suffering. Appearances of Christ in the Old Testament in terms of their presentation of the Trinity, the main difference between the Old and New Testaments is that in the New Testament, Christ is clearly visible and distinct from the Father, while in the Old Testament the Father and Son are often difficult to distinguish. Despite the previous discussion, there is a common misconception, even in many Christian circles, that the fact that the exact details about Christ's incarnation were shielded in the Old Testament means that the visible person in the Old Testament is primarily God the Father. This is not entirely accurate, for the Father has always appeared to the world through the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, and this fact was just as true in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. Only the manner of the Father's representation of Himself through His Son changed in the New Testament. An incarnate Jesus Christ becomes visible to the world, only His true glory is shielded, while in the Old Testament Christ also represents the Father, but not in incarnate form. Additionally, in the New Testament, when our Lord says, I and the Father are one, and John 10.30, or otherwise speaks the Father's words, 
John 8, 28 and 14, 24, the distinction between the Father and the Son, along with this unity, it is perfectly clear and obvious. However, in the Old Testament, when God appears, it is consistently the Son who appears, but as the representative of the Father, speaking the Father's words, so that the distinction between the two was not, at the time, completely understood or appreciated, John 8, 26 and 28. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say, John 12, 50. Definition of Theophany and Christophany The words Theophany and Christophany mean, respectively, an appearance of God and an appearance of Christ, the second part of each being derived from the Greek root fan, appear, from which we get the word phenomenon. In this section, it will be argued that in biblical terms, at any rate, the only category of event we really need to be concerned with here is Christophany, for in my view, all cases of theophany in the Old Testament are really Christophanies. It needs to be made clear right at the outset that by Christophany we are definitely not referring to the literal, physical appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ in His true humanity. Ever since His deity assumed true humanity at the Incarnation, Christ has not again appeared in temporary Christophanic form. The position that all Old Testament appearances of God are in reality appearances of Christ also allows for the possibility of other sorts of manifestations of the Father other than an ostensibly corporeal appearance here on earth such as a dream or vision, Daniel's vision of the Ancient of Days being the prime example, Daniel 7, 13 and 14, invisibility of the Father. Until we get to heaven, we will not see the Father. We know that the Father is not invisible to the angels, for they constantly see the face of my Father in heaven, Matthew eighteen ten. But He is our Heavenly Father, Matthew 6, 9 and six twenty six. And as long as the earthly conflict between his would-be usurper, Satan, and his designated regent, Christ, still rages, in heaven he remains for his majesty's sake, speaking and working his will through his servant. Until the final and ultimate victory, and only after the complete purging of the universe, will the Father come to the new earth to make his abode with us forever. Revelation 21, 1 through 3. Until that time... The Father, though acting and speaking through His representative, His Son, Jesus Christ, remains invisible to human eyes. But, He said, you cannot see My face, for a man may not see My face and live. Exodus 33, 20. Surely you are a God who hides Himself. Isaiah 45, 15. No one has ever seen God. God the only Son, the one who has always been at the Father's side, He has made Him known. John 1, 18. Not that anyone has seen the Father except He the Son, who has always been with the Father, he has seen the Father. John 6.46 He the Father who alone possesses immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has ever seen nor can see. 1 Timothy 6.16 No one has ever seen God. 1 John 4.12 Inaccessibility of the Father apart from Christ. If mankind were able to see God the Father in all His glory without perishing in the process, it is at least safe to say that the issue of human free will would be seriously compromised from that point forward. Confronted with the magnitude and majesty of God, not only would it be impossible to deny His existence, but it is also likely that even against their will, most men would find themselves obliged to follow Him and His will out of sheer terror, rather than from a truly free choice. Along with the principle of preserving mankind's free will, the issue of access to the Father also helps to explain why the Father remains unseen to us in this present life. Although, as discussed earlier in this study, the Father is omnipresent in His creation, for purposes of visibility to His creatures, He is invariably described in the Scriptures as residing in heaven, for example, Matthew 6, 9 and 6, 26. Obviously, as long as we live in these physical bodies, we cannot go to heaven to seek God, Deuteronomy 30, 12 and 13, and Romans 10, 6. The Father, by virtue of the fact that His throne room is in heaven, Revelation 4.2 and Hebrews 4.16, is inaccessible to us. This physical distance which separates us from the Father is indicative of the spiritual distance between God and mankind. As the person of the Trinity representing the authority and holiness of the Godhead, the righteous Father keeps Himself completely separate from human sin. It is in no small part because of mankind's sinfulness that face-to-face -face fellowship with the Father is impossible.
In fact, for sinful human beings to be confronted by God brings immediate realization that we are worthy of death by our very nature. Genesis 32.30 Woe is me, I am done for. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 6.5 Though we cannot go to heaven to plead our case with the Father, Christ Jesus is the one who has come down from heaven on our account, John 3.13. Through faith in him and his death for us, we now have access to the Father in his name. By his blood, that is, his death on the cross on our behalf, Christ has broken down the barrier of hostility between the Father and those who believe in his Son. Jesus Christ has made peace between us, and as a result, we now have been granted entrance into the throne room of heaven and the presence of the Father. This means that on the basis of the acceptability of Christ's sacrifice and our acceptance of Him, our prayers and petitions are heard by the Father now, and we ourselves shall enter into the heavenly holy of holies in His good time. So now that we have been justified by faith, let us take hold of the peace we have with God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have also obtained our access into this grace in which we stand. Romans 5, 1 and 2. For through him, Jesus Christ, we both Jews and Gentiles have access to the Father by one Spirit. Ephesians 2, 18. Being in him, Jesus Christ, and having confidence through our faith in him, we possess this access to the Father and freedom to speak to him. Ephesians 3, 12. So let us approach with confident free speech to the throne of grace of the Father, that we might receive his mercy and gain his favor for timely help. Hebrews 4.16 For Christ died once for us on account of our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. 1 Peter 3.18 The fact that through faith in the Son we now have full access to the Father, sonship, fellowship, acceptance of prayer, and eternal life with him, shows that before the Son came and died for us, such access was at least limited. The Father's splitting of the temple's veil at the conclusion of our Lord's sacrifice on our behalf is a dramatic indication that through his death, the barrier that had previously separated us from the Father, that is, our sins, has now been removed. Luke 23, 45.